2012 to 2014 with National Development Plan and the United Nations Assistance Framework, known as UNDAF, with this mandate. IUM strategy in Colombia covers migration management services, gender and counter-trafficking, health and migration, migration and childhood, community-oriented reintegration of ex-combatants, institutional strengthening for victims, uh, law implementation, migration and rural development, climate change and urban development, infrastructure for community stabilization, emergency and disaster risk management, social inclusions and sustainability, human rights and migration, human rights and migration, and corporate social responsibility and migration-induced projects. One of the most important IOM projects I found is Center for Colombian Reintegration Agency, known as ACR. Currently, the ACR has 31 service centers around the country. These offices are the main point of contact with the demobilized people in the region and are conformed mainly by leader reintegration professionals with an average of one professional per 80 demobilized people, reintegration evaluators, and judicial, technological, and administrative support professionals. IOM's major source of financial resources is Colombian government and international cooperation agencies and private sector. More than US dollar 54 million has been invested by IOM Colombia in around 7,400 income generating projects. Private sector also engaged in partnership with IOM to develop income generation activities. Uh, IOM's engagement in Colombia has the following challenges. One, strengthen work on migration and childhood, climate change and migration, project induced in migration and migration and rural development, Second, diversify sources of cooperation and expansion of private sector contributions. Third, develop social responsibility models for rural regions with investment projects, among others. And lastly, assistance for a high number of displaced persons. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you some pictures as a visual glimpse of the operational aspects of IOM in Haiti and Bogota during my visit. This is actually, I'm, I'm meeting at my left picture with the Vice Minister of Bogota, uh, Colombia. At the right side, I'm meeting the, the uh, relief arrangement, the emergency arrangements, logistics, uh, and the town hall meeting in, in Haiti. Next. Next. I'm sorry. Actually, these are the campsites I'm visiting. At my left is the, um, I think, the, the parasismic small shelters or houses built by IOM. And the right side is the, the I'm talking to the people who are responsible for the, the shelter for the emergency, uh, emergency shelters in, in, in Haiti. Nothing to say on the map. And this is, I think, I'm, I'm talking to the health workers in the camp. Next. Well, uh, this is the close meetings I have with uh, the people in Colombia the IOM uh, officials. I already explained this uh, slide. Next. So I'm sorry, uh, it may not be that pleasant anyway. So Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in my final analysis, I would like to say that IOM as field-oriented organization has been very much engaged with projects in the member countries. IOM in the crisis situations detailed a pool of professionals full of commitment and dedication. But in terms of the needs and projects, I consider IOM need more financial resources. Particularly for Haiti and Colombia, they could do more. 
In Haiti, the donors like the EU needs to focus, refocus its priority in terms of more engagement with predictable resources to cover and address more challenges. Donors' interest in Haiti should get renewed to support the transition from the emergency phase to recovery and technical cooperation, particularly MINUSTA, I mean the, the UN established mechanism for the stabilization of Haiti, also needs to reassure the donors and the partners that they will not withdraw from Haiti, the UN mission, in near future. Otherwise, the signal will go wrong. My meeting in both places, Haiti and Colombia, helped me as council chair to appreciate better the role, function, and mandate of IOM to deliver services to the member countries in time, in time of crucial needs. The field visits greatly enhanced my better understanding of IOM, better understanding of the work implemented at the field level, and the recognition to the outstanding work the, work of the IOM teams deserve for their performance both in Haiti and in Colombia. One particular aspect in Haiti I found missing is the income generating activities or projects for the IDPs resettled. In Colombia, IOM's engagement has been articulated and recognized as a Colombia model. For the IDPs, there are some income generating activities and people are reintegrated under reconciliation process. Finally, if the purpose of the visit is to enhance the understanding of the work of IOM in the field, I believe in my case it has served very well. I can confidently say that IOM is indeed delivering meaningful services in the field. Most importantly, it would be remiss on my part if I don't mention the professionalism, dedication, and the devotion of the two chiefs of missions of IOM in Bogota and Porto Spain, uh, Porto Prince, and their teams demonstrated. They should be rewarded for their hard work and challenging, challenging responsibilities. Let me conclude here by reiterating that the visit particularly afforded me a unique opportunity to renew IOM's commitment to support the transition from the emergency phase to recovery and technical cooperation in both Colombia and Haiti. Thank you very much for bearing with me. Now I would like to open the floor if any would like to have some comments. Floor is open. Eh, muchas gracias, señor presidente, y un saludo para todos los ministros, embajadores y demás delegados en esta nueva sesión del, del Consejo de la OIM. Queremos, señor presidente, agradecerle muy brevemente su visita a nuestro país, la cual es evidencia del compromiso eh, de, de esta organización, de su director general y de su equipo, eh, con nuestro país, el apoyo a nuestra población, a nuestros migrantes y sobre todo su gran compromiso con la institucionalidad colombiana. Eh, nos ha presentado usted un informe muy completo, el cual le agradecemos y sobre todo destacamos eh, la eh, frase que, con la que ha concluido respecto a lo esencial de los servicios de la OIM en Colombia. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Madam, for the comments. If there is no request from the floor, I will give the floor to Director General Mr. Swing. Mr. Swing. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to express my appreciation in behalf of all of us at IOM to the Chair for this. Uh, informative report, and in particular for his taking the time from a very busy schedule to visit two of our most uh, important field missions. And I want to comment just briefly on both Colombia and Haiti. Um, the IOM mission in Colombia is IOM's largest mission in the world in two respects, budget and the number of uh, sub-officers, of which there are some 27 throughout Colombia. Under what's being called the Colombian model, the government of Colombia provides 80% of our total operational budget. In other words, they're providing a roughly $140 million from the government budget to enable us 
to do projects of interest to the government and in accordance with our own mandate and constitution uh, allows us to maintain a very large and sustained presence uh, throughout the country to work as an implementing partner on these projects. A wide variety of areas, as mentioned by the chair, all the way from community stabilization uh, to migration and development projects. Uh, this allows us uh, to face up to the problem, the challenge of middle income countries in which donor support is waning or lacking altogether by using government funds to get the migration projects done that are needed. Uh, I myself will be going to Colombia this weekend in connection with two events there. One, a global conference on disarmament, uh, demobilization, and reintegration at uh, Santa Marta, and going from there to Cartagena for the annual South American Conference on Migration. Uh, IOM Haiti is very close to my heart because I spent five years there and I had the honor at the time in 1994 of bringing IOM into Haiti primarily to help with the demobilization of the entire Haitian army to teach civilian skills for a new life for them. Um, we have had a big office ever since. We had about 100 people at the time of the 12 January 2010 earthquake. We scaled up virtually overnight to 400, and today uh, Haiti is the largest uh, mission in the world from a staffing point of view with more than 500 international and national staff. They're working not only in the capital Port-au-Prince but in three sub-offices. They're doing a wide range of activities, but I'm glad that the chair focused particularly on the good work that's being done in camp coordination, camp management, and shelter where we have the cluster lead working very closely with MINUSTA and the government. Um, we, I was able, when I saw President Martelli a few months ago, to say that I had both good news and bad news, the good news being that 1.2 million Haitians were no longer living in tents but in transitional housing, but that unfortunately about 300,000 were still in tents. And this has partly to do with the absorptive capacity of the housing market and the economy. So we're very happy for that. We're continuing to work on the cholera response and still working on the 2008 flooding in the port city of Gonaive uh, in, in the Artibonite. So, so there's a lot of work still to be done there and we are responding to these needs as well as those of, of irregular migrants and former victims of trafficking. Let me close by saying that uh, it was in, of enormous benefit to our programs, both in Colombia and Haiti, to have our chair visit there. It boosted morale. It helped them to know that headquarters from the very top of its chair were, were interested in and supporting the programs there. So I'd like to thank you, Mr. Ambassador, most sincerely for your visit and your report. And I think one lesson that you learned that you taught us about is that we need to get the chair to an overseas field visit much earlier in their tenure so that you can benefit much more from having that perspective of a field visit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swing, for your uh, reflections and kind words. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us turn to our uh, uh, agenda item, uh, election of chairperson. I now invite the Council to nominate a candidate for the Office of the Chairperson of the Council. May I uh, uh, request uh, uh, Her Excellency Madame Laura Dupay, uh, the permanent representative of Uruguay, uh, to propose uh, the Chairperson. Con mucho gusto, señor Presidente. Tengo el honor de tomar la palabra para presentar en nombre del Grupo de Países de Latinoamérica y del Caribe, el GRULAC, la nominación para la presidencia de esta centésima tercera reunión del Consejo de la OIM al señor representante permanente del Perú, embajador Luis Enrique Chávez Basagoitía. El embajador Chávez Basagoitía posee una larga trayectoria profesional y la experiencia necesaria para conducir con éxito los trabajos y desafíos que enfrenta la organización en el cumplimiento de su mandato. Entre otros, 
ocupó el, los cargos de director de Derechos Humanos y Asuntos Sociales, director de Asuntos Políticos Multilaterales y de Seguridad, y director general para Asuntos Multilaterales y Globales en la Cancillería del Perú. En el extranjero cumplió funciones en Venezuela, Colombia, Ginebra y Nueva York, y también en Buenos Aires en su cargo de cónsul general del Perú. Asimismo, en numerosas ocasiones ha manifestado un vasto conocimiento de la OIM, capacidad para liderar los procesos que atraviesa la organización y gran compromiso en la búsqueda de la mejor gobernanza de la inmigración o la migración internacional. Por último, deseo hacer un reconocimiento al trabajo que ha venido desempeñando en la mesa, tanto usted, señor presidente, estimado embajador, eh, y destacando por cierto sus visitas a la región, como también eh, por nuestra querida embajadora de Colombia, Alicia Arango Olmos, quien ha sido convocada para ocupar otras funciones que la alejarán de Ginebra. A ella permítame, este, en nombre de Grulac, agradecerle profundamente el rol activo y protagónico ejercido durante su gestión en Ginebra, no solo en la OIM, sino también en otros organismos internacionales, y por cierto le deseamos el mayor de los éxitos en sus eh, próximas tareas. Muchísimas gracias, señor Presidente. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Ambassador, for proposing the name. Uh, may I now give the floor to His Excellency Ayar Diallo Thiam, uh, Param Representative of Mali, uh, to second the proposal. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je voudrais tout d'abord saluer toutes les délégations présentes et dire que le Mali soutient effectivement la candidature qui vient d'être présentée. Je vous remercie. I thank the ambassador of Mali for uh, seconding the proposal. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask the council if it wishes to elect his excellency Mr. Louis Enrique Chavez Basagotia a permanent representative of Peru as chairperson of the council. So, <laughs> so I have no hesitation to declare him elected. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Uh, as uh, His Excellency the Louis uh, Enric uh, uh, Chavez Basagotia is elected as the new chair for IUM Council for the term 2013-14, I believe I need to say something. Before I invite uh, Ambassador to take his place in the podium, I would like to congratulate the new chair for his election. In the period ahead, Ambassador Basagotia will take charge of carrying forward the discussion on migration in the post-2015 development agenda that has generated from the high-level dialogue held in September in New York. He will also lead the discussions on the relations between the IUM and uh, UN and IUM if the Council so decides. I am confident with ample experience and vast knowledge, uh, Ambassador Basagoitia will successfully carry, for, carry forward his work and lead the Council to its cherished destination. During the last one year, IUM has progressed in several areas. On institutional level, it has come to a point to finally enforce the amendment to the Constitution to abolish the Executive Committee. We have witnessed the re-election of Ambassador uh, William Leslie Swing as the DG of the organization. Successful participation of the organization in the high-level dialogue on migration and further expansion of membership of the organization. In discharging my duties to the Council, I am highly indebted to some persons without whom I could not have finished my job. I profusely thank Ambassador Barton Combrose as the chair of the working group and budget for agreeing to take up his arduous task. I would also like to thank the Ambassador of Colombia and the Ambassador of Zimbabwe as a Buru member to support me tirelessly. I would also like to thank the staff members of IOM. I am impressed at the state of IOM and the efforts of the organization. I take this opportunity to thank firstly the Director General 
and Mr. Swing and the DDG and Mr. Laura for their dedication to the organization as well as to the cause of migrants around the world. My special thanks to the Secretariat, in particular the Meeting Secretariat and the Chief of Staff, Mr. Ovais Sarma, Erika, Patricia, and Samri, and Jill, uh, Mr. Reed, and Mr. Yuan for their relentless efforts to make my tenure as chair a success and continuously facilitating my work. I profusely thank also the delegations for their presence, active participation, and tremendous support to me. I assured the new chair that he will be in good hands, and I wish Ambassador Basaguitia all the success in his work as chair of the IM Council, while I assure him of my and my delegation's support to his mandate. With this note, I would like to invite Mr. Louis Enrique Chavez Basaguitia to take his place on the podium as chairperson of the 103rd session of the Council. Ambassador Louis. Siguiendo con la agenda, corresponde ahora que el Consejo proceda con la elección del primer vicepresidente, del segundo vicepresidente y del relator. Para tal efecto, le voy a dar la palabra al excelentísimo señor Takahashi Okada, representante permanente adjunto del Japón, para que proponga a los integrantes de la mesa. Señor embajador, tiene usted la palabra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and allow me first to congratulate you on your election to the chairmanship of IOM Council and say that, Ambassador, you will have our full support as you deliberate over our work. I now have the honor to propose Ambassador Minalik Alem Gataham, permanent representative of Ethiopia to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, for the position of the first vice chairperson. Ambassador Minelik is well known to us all and brings a distinguished diplomatic career to the position. He has great experience in the multilateral work that confronts us. I consider that Ambassador Minelik is an eminently suitable person for the position of the first vice chairperson and will bring real strength to the Bureau. I am also pleased to nominate Ambassador Bertrand de Kronberg permanent representative of Belgium to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva for the position of second vice chair. Ambassador Kronberg is equally known to everybody and the IOM as he was the rapporteur for the last 12 months and as the chair of the working group on budget reform. Last but not least, I would like to nominate Ms. Kate O'Malley Minister Councillor Immigration of the Australian Permanent Mission to the United Nations for the position of rapporteur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Muchas gracias, Embajador. Le voy a dar la palabra ahora al señor Richard Swart de la Delegación de los Estados Unidos de América para secundar estas designaciones. El señor Swart tiene la palabra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The United States is pleased to second the nomination of His Ex Excellency Ambassador Gedehun, the permanent representative of Ethiopia, for the position of first vice chairman. Ambassador de Kromberg 
Permanent Representative of Belgium for the position of Second Vice Chair, and Ms. O'Malley, Minister Consular for the Australian Permanent Mission for the position of Rapporteur. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, habiendo escuchado estas intervenciones, pregunto al Consejo si podemos proceder entonces a elegir a los vicepresidentes y al relator conforme a lo que ha sido propuesto y secundado. Al no ver ninguna objeción, declaro electos a los demás miembros de la mesa. Muchísimas gracias. Antes de continuar con la agenda, permítanme simplemente salirme unos segundos del libreto para, eh, primero, eh, ante todo, agradecerles por la confianza que depositan en mi persona para presidir esta reunión. Me siento muy honrado porque entiendo que es una reunión del Consejo muy particular desde el punto de vista de los temas que vamos a tratar como ya lo señaló mi amigo el, el presidente saliente el embajador Hanan la OIM está en un punto crucial donde va a tener que comenzar a reflexionar sobre su propio futuro tanto en lo que concierne a sus planes de trabajo, a su propia agenda, como a su relación con el sistema de las Naciones Unidas en general. Otra razón por la cual este es un consejo muy particular es porque es el primero que se produce dentro de una nueva arquitectura institucional que deriva de la entrada en vigor de las enmiendas a la Constitución de la organización. Eh, así que eh, me siento por eso muy honrado y también muy agradecido porque provengo de un país y de una región que se ve a sí misma como una región eh, profundamente comprometida con el fenómeno migratorio. América Latina reúne todas las facetas de la migración. Somos países de origen, somos países de tránsito y crecientemente ahora en estos últimos años nuevamente países de destino. Así que es, creo, para mí una razón para agradecer también a mis colegas latinoamericanos por apoyarme en esta tarea. Quiero felicitar eh, ciertamente al embajador Anán, al que le agradezco mucho eh, su, por su apoyo en los días y semanas previas a este consejo. Me siento mucho mejor preparado para esta tarea gracias a su ayuda. Y quiero felicitar a los demás eh, miembros de la mesa, eh, solamente eh, colegas, sino también amigos los embajadores de Etiopía y Bélgica y la señora O'Malley de Australia. Y también eh, agradecer desde ya a todo el personal de la organización a través de su director general por el apoyo que me han venido dando eh, y su disponibilidad mostrada en todos los días previos al comienzo de este consejo. Muchas gracias por su atención. Quisiera eh, que pasemos en este momento a aprobar el programa provisional revisado que ustedes tienen en el documento bajo la asignatura MC barra 2375 barra revisión 3. Quisiera saber si hay algún comentario sobre este documento. No veo ninguno. Entonces creo que eh, podemos darlo por adoptado.
Pasando al tema 7 de la agenda, llamado, titulado debate general, quiero señalar a la atención del Consejo que la lista de oradores para las delegaciones que deseen inscribirse en este debate fue abierta el 11 de noviembre. Actualmente, la Secretaría de Reuniones, que se encuentra en esta sala, en una mesa aquí a la derecha del podio, se encarga de esta lista de oradores. Por lo tanto, invito a las delegaciones que aún no se hubiesen inscrito que lo hagan antes de las 13 horas del día de mañana, miércoles 27 de noviembre, que es la hora en que la lista quedará cerrada. También deseo aprovechar esta oportunidad para recordar a las delegaciones cuáles son los tiempos de palabra asignados que no deben ser superados. Es decir, para los ministros y los grupos regionales, 10 minutos. Para los Estados miembros, 5 minutos. Y 3 minutos para los observadores. En vista del poco tiempo del que disponemos, el debate general se iniciará esta mañana, en cuanto terminemos con los demás temas, con las, delegaciones, con las declaraciones de los señores ministros. Finalmente, deseo indicar que los textos completos de las declaraciones de las delegaciones que hayan sido entregados a la Secretaría de Reuniones serán publicados en el sitio web de la OIM, a menos que se haya solicitado explícitamente que no se publiquen. En cuanto al programa del día de hoy, Quisiera eh, señalar que en el marco del tema 5, el Consejo tomará una decisión relativa a la admisión de cuatro nuevos miembros y cinco nuevos observadores. Luego pasaremos al tema 6, en cuyo marco el director general presentará su informe ante la centésima tercera reunión del Consejo. Como ya señalé anteriormente, el debate general comenzará inmediatamente después de las declaraciones de los señores ministros y de los grupos regionales. Hoy en la tarde, a las tres horas, se abordarán las cuestiones de gobernanza de la OIM y aquellas deliberadas en el seno del Comité Permanente de Programas y Finanzas. En vista de la importancia del tema... Yo les ruego que estén presentes a las 3 de la tarde porque tengo la intención de empezar a las 3 de la tarde con quienes estén en la sala. Tengo también el gusto de informarles que esta noche, inmediatamente después de nuestra sesión de la tarde, todos eh, los participantes estamos invitados a una recepción que tendrá lugar en el restaurante de delegados, en el octavo piso del edificio A. Eh, agradezco desde ya al Departamento Federal de Asuntos Exteriores de Suiza, que es nuestro anfitrión esta noche. Con esto concluimos el tema 4 de la agenda y vamos a comenzar con el tema 5 a solicitudes de admisión como miembros de la organización. Como ustedes podrán ver en eh, los documentos que han sido distribuidos, hemos recibido cuatro solicitudes de admisión como miembros de la delegación. Estas solicitudes han sido presentadas por los gobiernos de Turkmenistán, la República de Islandia, la República de Fiji y la República de las Islas Marshall. Corresponde ahora al Consejo considerar estas solicitudes y adoptar las resoluciones relativas para la admisión como miembro de la organización. Así también escucharemos a los representantes de Turkmenistán, la República de Islandia, la República de Fiji y la República de las Islas Marshall. Y finalmente, al final de este punto, escucharemos la intervención del señor director general. Por consiguiente, invito al Consejo a que considere los proyectos de resolución relativos a las solicitudes de admisión 
de Turkmenistán, la República de Islandia, la República de Fiji y la República de las Islas Marshall. Quisiera saber si hay algún comentario sobre alguna de estas cuatro resoluciones. Muy bien, de no ser el caso, declaro adoptadas las resoluciones antes mencionadas y por consiguiente han quedado admitidos los nuevos miembros por aclamación. Es uh, un honor darles pues la bienvenida a esta sesión del Consejo a, la a Turkmenistán, la República de Islandia, la República de Fiji y la República de las Islas Marshall. Pasando al siguiente punto de la agenda, punto 5B, solicitudes para hacerse representar por un observador. Tengo también el gusto de informar al Consejo que se han recibido cinco solicitudes para hacerse representar por un observador. Estas corresponden al International Medical Corps, la Comisión de la Comunidad Económica de los Estados de África Occidental, el Fondo de las Naciones Unidas para la Infancia, la Federación Internacional Terre des Hommes, y CARAM Asia. Por consiguiente, solicito al Consejo que examine los proyectos de resolución relativos a estas solicitudes para hacerse representar por un observador. Si hubiese algún comentario. Muchas gracias. No siendo este el caso, declaro adoptadas las resoluciones y por tanto la consiguiente admisión de los nuevos observadores por aclamación. Les damos también la bienvenida. Le doy eh, a continuación la palabra a la representación de Turkmenistán, nuestro nuevo miembro. Tiene la palabra. Туркменистана обусловленная политикой президента Туркменистана открытых дверей сделала актуальным вопрос более тесного интегрированного партнерства с МОН. Это подразумевает вступление Туркменистана в Международную организацию по миграции в качестве полноправного члена. При этом хотелось подчеркнуть, что практическая деятельность Туркменистана и ее активная позиция в решении задач, стоящих перед Международной организацией по миграции, обусловила необходимость выступления нашей страны в МОН. Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемый член Совета, разрешите выразить признательность руководству организации и всем государственным членам МОН за поддержку кандидатуры Туркменистана в принятое Туркменистан член, членство организации, а также позу случаем поздравить всех принятых по итогам решения 103 сессии Совета МОН других государств членов организации, которые, как и Туркменистан, сегодня стали членом МОМ. Решение Туркменистана о вступлении в МОМ является логическим продолжением уже долгосрочного, продуктивного и перспективного сотрудничества. Туркменистан 
Я являюсь равноправным участником системы международных отношений. Наглядно демонстрирует свою приверженность высшим идеалам гуманизма, принципам демократического развития и современного права общества. Необходимо констатировать, что Туркменистан создан и действует целостной и эффективной системы правовой и социальной защиты мигрантов, успешно реализуется законодательство о беженцах, лицах без гражданства, которые отвечают требованиям международных стандартов. В пользу случаем я хочу выразить глубокую признательность за помощь и поддержку МОМ, представляемым нашей стране в проведении совместных проектов, программ, международных конференций и за обеспечение многосторонних платформ для миграционного диалога. Принимая во внимание включение Туркменистан в качестве полноправного члена организации, Туркменистан намерен самым активным образом участвовать в ее деятельности. В качестве члена МОН Туркменистан будет рассматривать возможность своего активного участия в международных региональных и субрегиональных инициативах и программах в отвлекаемых организациях. В завершение хотелось бы еще раз подчеркнуть, что Туркменистан нацелен на поиск эффективных и надежных решений глобальным миграционным вызовам, а также развитие сотрудничества с МОН в укреплении систем управления национальной и региональной миграции. Благодарю за внимание. Muchas gracias, señor representante de Turkmenistán. Eh, pregunto si alguno representante de los otros tres nuevos miembros eh, desea hacer uso de la palabra ahora o si algún otro Estado miembro desea hacer uso de la palabra en representación de los nuevos miembros. Muy bien, no parece ser ese el caso. Le agradezco nuevamente a Turkmenistán por su intervención y reitero nuestra bienvenida a los nuevos Estados miembros. Quisiera ahora darle la palabra a los nuevos observadores. Eh, en primer lugar, tiene la palabra eh, el representante de ECOWAS. Mr. Chairman, IOM Director General, Ambassador William Lisa Swing, Excellencies, Heads of Delegations, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, firstly, on behalf of the President of the ECOWAS Commission, His Excellency Kadril Desire Widrago, I would like to express our profound gratitude to the International Organization for Migration, IOM, for the invitation extended to our organization to assume the status of observer in your esteemed organization and to participate in the deliberation of this August gathering. We feel greatly honored by this invitation, especially given the esteemed status of the International Organization for Migration as its leading intergovernmental organization in the field of migration, with vast experiences in migration management. Migration remains a part of human way of life, especially for we Africans. Migrants are agents of change. Although in the past the social impact of migration was measured from a negative perspective. In Africa, the age-long practice of people migrating from across the continent to Europe and America for economic reasons has not changed much. Today, as in the past, conflicts and boundary realignments, climate change and environment are determinants of migration within and across the continent. Indeed, no region is immune from the wave of immigration. However, the risk associated with increased wave of migration across the globe present far greater challenges than ever before to governments and security agencies across the globe. Migration is no longer the usual southward movement of people from Africa to Europe and America. It is now a continuous circle of people across the continents for economic, social, political and technological reasons 
with far greater security challenges than previously imagined. To address these challenges, the ECOWAS Commission is continually working with partners, including IOM, to curb irregular migration while promoting regular migration. By encouraging member states to adhere to the precepts of the ECOWAS protocol of free movement of persons and the region common approach and migration for migration and development. The free movement protocol has evolved into one of the key pillars of our regional integration agenda, making the ECOWAS space the only visa free reg regime in Africa. To assist the region in reigning in re irregular migration, the European Union has made available a grant of 25 million euros for a program to be implemented by ECOWAS in partnership with IOM and a consortium. Part of this grant is earmarked for capacity building and enlightenment campaigns against irregular migration while encouraging regular migration. Also, the International Organization for Migration continues to work with a number of ECOWAS member states on combating human trafficking, labor migration, the protection of children, and general migration and development issues. It is our fervent hope and prayer that this mutually beneficial collaboration between our two organizations will be stepped up for the benefits of the people of our region and the international community at large. We trust that these experiences and lessons learned from information sharing and building of synergy between two organizations, ours and yours, will be to the overall benefit of humankind. Thank you again for accepting us as observer. Muchas gracias por su intervención. Tiene la palabra el representante del Fondo de las Naciones Unidas para la Infancia, UNICEF. Distinguished Chairperson, Ambassadors Wing, Excellencies, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, is very pleased to join the Council of the International Organization for Migration as an observer and would like to thank IOM members for considering favorably our application. UNICEF trusts that the observer status will contribute to enhancing the visibility of the human rights and protection needs of all children in the context of migration and their families in countries of origin, transit and destination, particularly in the post-2015 development agenda. UNICEF is working closely with IOM on strengthening the global protection mechanism for unaccompanied and separate migrant children. UNICEF looks forward to consolidating its cooperation with IOM at the field level in the years to come in a number of strategic areas, such as the initiative on mainstreaming migration into national development strategies, the data and the measurement work, the environmental change induced migration. UNICEF is committed to continuing its very fruitful collaboration with IOM in humanitarian assistance activities, including pre-crisis preparedness, emergency response, and post-crisis recovery. UNICEF congratulates IOM for its able chairmanship of the Global Migration Group during the second semester for 2013 and for its leadership in advocating for the inclusion of migration in the post-2015 development framework. We are also looking forward to working closely with IOM in 2014 as it assumes the chairmanship of the Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking in Human Beings. UNICEF stands ready to support IOM, member states and partners in these efforts, always with a focus on fulfilling the human rights of migrants and their families and on the social dimension of migration. Thank you. Um. No sé si hay algún otro representante. Uh, ah, perdón. Eh, tiene la palabra la Federación Internacional Terre des Hommes. Yeah, distinguished chairman, distinguished uh, director general, excellencies, heads of delegations, ladies and gentlemen. We wish to express our gratitude to the Council for accepting Terre des Hommes to take part in the work of the International Organization for Migration with an observer status to the meeting of the IOM Council. We strongly appreciate the necessary steps taken to submit this request. 
Der Desam is a child rights federation of 10 member members working with 800 partner organizations in 70 countries. Der Desam has a long working relationship with IOM at operational level and at global level. Der Desam is running a campaign on children on the move, so on the rights of children in the context of migration called Destination Unknown. In the recent month, Terre des Hommes launched the campaign in additional countries, such as in France, in several states in India, and in the Mekong region. Both IOM and Terre des Hommes are active members of the interagency group on children on the move, which uh, strengthens the implementation of the rights of children in the context of migration. At the high-level dialogue on migration and development, on 3rd and 4th of October, Civil society brought a unity message, one carved out of national and regional consultations, an eight-point agenda to work with governments over a five-year period, an, ag an agenda to bring about substantive change, to demonstrate commitments, and to bring an end to the globalization of indifference, an, an, an agenda where, amongst others, children, children were not left, left out. The eight-point agenda is on the back table, and I encourage you to take the agenda if you haven't uh, have had the occasion of reading it, of working with it. The proposals by civil society are without precedent in depth and specifics. Civil society came to the high-level dialogue more prepared than ever to discuss with governments. Civil society is with a great degree of optimism that, in fact, civil society organizations can make major changes. Amongst a strong civil society community involved, Terre des Hommes contributed to the collective work and specifically to sharpen messages on children on the move, on the rights of children in the context of migration, such as the fact that immigration detention of children must stop, such as a child must be guaranteed access to services, health services, education, to protection and justice regardless of migration status. The output document of the second high-level dialogue represents a significant advance on many issues, among which how the issues of children affected by mig migration are approached. Making the case for migration in the post-2015 development agenda is on our common agenda. It is one of the eight agenda points of civil society it's on IOM's agenda. Negotiation and implementation of existing and future goals will depend critically on the level of support and pressure from civil society at national level. With the Destination Unknown campaign led by Terre des Hommes, we seek to increase public voice and the children's voice. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias a usted por su intervención. Um, Pregunto si hubiese en la sala algún representante de las otras dos organizaciones admitidas como observadores que desee hacer uso de la palabra. No parece ser el caso. Les agradezco a los observadores por sus declaraciones y les reitero nuestra cordial bienvenida en nombre de todo el Consejo. Eh, sobre este punto, antes de concluir, también eh, quiero dar la palabra al señor director general para que les dé a su vez la bienvenida a los nuevos miembros y observadores. Mejor sí, tiene usted la palabra. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's with uh, immense pleasure and satisfaction that I, in behalf of all of our colleagues in IOM, welcome these four new members and five new observer states, uh, five new observers. Um, I think that your individual decisions to join and become part of IOM is a reflection of several uh, trends in the world today. First of all, an inexorably growing interest in migration matters as a fact of everyday life with which governments and organizations have to deal. Secondly, uh, the increasing recognition of IOM as the global lead agency on migration. And perhaps the third trend is the manifestation of the priority of partnership uh, in getting anything done in the field of migration. 
Um, on the individual uh, states that have joined, uh, I had the honor and pleasure to visit uh, uh, Turkmenistan to the capital Ashgabat uh, earlier this year, an opportunity to meet with the president, the foreign minister, uh, through the good offices of the ambassador here. Very good chance this morning to speak to the vice minister who has honored us with his presence today. Um, I want to thank the vice minister for underscoring the need for uh, an integrated and coherent system to manage migration, which I think is the goal of us all. Uh, his emphasis on protecting migrants uh, is one, certainly, of IOM's largest priorities. And we're looking forward to working with the government of Turkmenistan in this regard, and looking forward to Turkmenistan's efforts to foster regional cooperation in migration governance. Um, I have not had the chance to visit Fiji. Uh, I want to underscore, though, that Fiji is playing a number of important roles in the field of migration. They are chair currently of the G77 for 2013. They are also uh, in the alliance of small island states. They're chairing that also. Uh, that contains 44 uh, island state members. Uh, it's the regional hub that is hosting the Secretariat of the Pacific Islands Forum, as well as the Secretariat of the Pacific Immigration Directors Conference. Um, so this is giving us a good forum for addressing migration in the Pacific Island, uh, the Pacific uh, Ocean area, uh, where lots of issues such as climate change are going to be uh, front and center in the future. Um, I had the honor of meeting the Foreign Minister of Fiji in New York uh, on the margins of the UN General Assembly in September, and we were very pleased that they moved so quickly to get their request for membership in. Um, the, similarly, with uh, the Marshall Islands, neither of whom could be present today, um, we established an office there in 2009. We signed a cooperation agreement uh, in 2012. The Federated States of Micronesia, a neighboring country, had joined earlier in 2011. So there is a whole coalition of Pacific Island states that are now uh, coming uh, to IOM uh, in partnership to address a number of their issues. I uh, hope to be able to visit both Fiji and the Marshall Islands sometime next year, possibly in the context of my participation at the um, uh, Landlock and Small Island States Summit in Samoa in September 2014. Um, I had the opportunity to meet the President of Ireland uh, several times at Davos, and I'm looking forward to working with the Ambassador here. Uh, I will be uh, to, to be uh, sorry, the President of Iceland, in order to go there sometime in the coming year to pay my respects and thank them for joining forces with us in the uh, field of migration. Uh, so I hope that that will take place soon. As far as our observers are concerned, we're absolutely delighted to welcome you on board. Um, when I was in the Philippines last week visiting the devastated areas from the typhoon, I saw a number of these same observers that work there hand in hand with us, uh, certainly with uh, IMC, the International Medical Corps, UNICEF. Uh, we had good, uh, good partnership with uh, Terre des Hommes, as mentioned already by the representative, and we are working closely with Karam Asia. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome all of you and look forward to enhancing and expanding uh, our already excellent cooperation. So a hearty welcome to you all. Thank you. Muchas gracias, señor director general. Con uh, esta intervención concluimos con el tema 5 de la agenda. Vamos a dar inicio al tema 6, es uno de nuestros puntos centrales. Eh, creo que todos tendremos mucho interés de escuchar el informe del señor director general. Así que sin más trámite le doy la palabra a embajador Swing para que por favor nos presente su informe.
Mr. Chair, Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, when I became Director General in 2008, I changed the name of this uh, intervention from a statement to a report. I tried to announce to you the concept that this is your organization, it doesn't belong to us. You elected me and the Deputy Director General, and we have selected a staff in the administration that are managing the International Organization for Migration for you. It is your organization, and I'm very pleased at the way in which member states have really taken hold of this and are putting forward their own ideas as to what this organization should be and what it should be doing. At the special council session in June, I announced my intention to pursue three objectives in the mandate period before us between now and 2000, uh, uh, 2018. There were three of these, namely continuity in those things which seem to be working well for us. Uh, secondly, coherence with the other regional, national, and global actors in the field of migration. And thirdly, to change what is needed and possible. Uh, I wanted to elaborate a little more on that today uh, and share my views and seek your own on the way forward in the five years ahead. Now, since last year's council session, the 102nd, we have witnessed a very active year marked by significant highs and lows. The sum of these would appear to have ushered the question of human mobility into a potential watershed period in the global debate on migration governance. This is an era in which more people are living outside their native country than at any other time in recorded history. Also, migration continues to grow in importance for the governments, even though for some, if not many, migration remains an intractable issue a puzzling problem rather than a possible element of solution to their demographic and labor market concerns that affect their search for sustainable, inclusive growth. Now, IOM, with 97% of its staff in the field, remains and shall continue to be a quintessentially field organization. In this case, I share the principle of my good friend Peter Maurer, president of the ICRC, the principle of proximity. We are a proximity organization. That is, we need to be on the ground at any time to be of assistance with whatever happens or occurs, whether it be the political upheavals, whether it be the typhoon in the Philippines or the capsized ships off the coast of Lampedusa and Malta or persons dying in the Red Sea trying to get from the Horn of Africa to Saudi Arabia. We need to be there if we're going to be of help. So looking at some of the highs, clearly this has been a significant year with the UN's General Assembly holding its second high-level dialogue on international migration and development. Now, it's very interesting that this was only the second time that the General Assembly has ever held a formal session to deal with migration. Uh, the issue is how do we deal, how do we uh, conjugate the paradox between national sovereignty and individual freedom, the dueling narrative between control and facilitation and the gradual awakening of governments 
to the link between migration and development planning. Uh, it's been remarkable for a number of reasons, the, the high-level dialogue. First of all, and we'll look at this in more detail later, and there is a paper just at the entrance of the uh, hall here uh, on our analysis of the high-level dialogue. So you'll have that in more detail, and there will be a high-level session later this week with the, under, with the Deputy Secretary General of the UN and the Special Representative, the Secretary General for Migration, on the high-level dialogue and the way forward. But there was a remarkable degree of convergence on key issues, and we will elaborate on those. Uh, the challenge for IOM, the Global Forum, and the Global Migration Group is how do we take forward these words into an active program. We have begun, and you will see in the course of my presentation, we've already begun to implement them from an IOM point of view. The second high for us was the Diaspora Ministerial Conference held in June here in Geneva. Uh, it was quite remarkable, very well attended, 653 participants, 548 government delegates, of which there were 55 ministers, and senior government officials, 49 international organization representatives, and 38 from civil society. The conference and the publication of its proceedings was a further contribution to the high-level dialogue. Now, many participants suggested even on the first day that IOM should regularly hold such global conferences. We looked at a number of things, including our budget, and said, well, we can't do it every year but maybe we could do it every other year. And so we are looking forward now, and we're interested in your views on it, to holding another global conference in 2015, in Geneva probably, on the question of migrants and cities. How do they interact? What is the dynamic? What can we learn together to help policymakers to do, some, to do better than we've done in the past in welcoming and integrating uh, migrants who come to our, our shores. The third high was the post-2015 United Nations Development Agenda. We've all worked very hard to get migration inserted into the new agenda. It was absent totally from the, uh, from the Millennium Development Goals, and we would like to avoid a re repetition of that. So we organized with UNFPA, one of our traditional partners, the Global Thematic Consultation on Population Dynamics in Dhaka, Bangladesh, in March. We pub published in September a series of essays on the evidence supporting migration's relevance for the post-2015 agenda. And then the final high for us was the evolution of IOM. Uh, we began in 1951 as a committee, actually a provisional committee, that was supposed to go out of existence once the ravages of the Second World War uh, had been addressed by moving people to safer and more secure lives abroad. Uh, and yet, we've survived all of that. We've continued. We're now in, we have a certain permanence now. We're moving toward universal membership with 155 and a number of other countries which did not complete the application in time but who will be brought in at, this, at the spring session. Um, secondly, it's, uh, I think, more relevant than ever before uh, with increasing access, increasing support, and increasing respect. The first time an IOM Director General has ever been asked to speak at a meeting of the Chief Executives Board, which is the whole UN system, 40-some agency heads who come together, uh, it's the first time that the Deputy Director General has been invited to the high-level committee on, my, on uh, management, and the first time I've been invited to address the high-level committee on policy. It's also the first time this year that an IOM staff member has ever been appointed as a UN resident coordinator. Uh, so these are some of the highs of the year. Unfortunately, there are a lot of lows. Perhaps the most important one being the armed attack on IOM in Kabul, in which one of our staff members eventually succumbed 
from the injuries and burns received in that vicious attack. Uh, highly professional, totally dedicated, extremely popular, and extremely effective. This person uh, was an enormous loss to her family, to her friends, to all of us. And I had the great honor, along with our senior, senior regional advisor, Mr. Ambrosi, to take part in Italy and Rome at a ceremony in which the Italian president, uh, President Napolitano, posthumously bestowed the Grand Cross of Honor of the Order of the Star of Italy uh, on this person, uh, and we were there in attendance with the family. Uh, the attack provoked injuries to several other IOM staff and the destruction of our entire compound. We lost not 24 hours in continuing our work. We're back in another compound now. Our work is continuing and actually is expanding. Um, there's a continuing rise in anti-migrant sentiment, unfortunately. It's taking place in national laws that criminalize irregular migrants, those without proper papers, and we cannot help them once they're criminalized. Uh, they're tightening visa regimes. There are insufficient legal migration uh, alternatives, and there are overly restrictive migration policies. When I was in Lampedusa and Malta interviewing Eritreans, Somalis, Syrians, uh, other parts of, of the Middle East and Africa and other parts of the world, every person that I spoke to had lost either a spouse, a parent, or a child, in some cases all three, in those boats trying to make it across the Mediterranean. Policies clearly have to be reviewed, and we have to put the focus on saving life, the most important thing, and then one can look at the options. Because clearly some of these people are, are obviously have a strong case to be given asylum. Others merely want to be reunited with their family who are already living north of the Mediterranean. And others clearly are being trafficked and need to be assisted and eventually taken home. But we will not get to that point of looking at these alternatives of these mixed flows if they die at sea beforehand. Same thing, dying in the desert. We've also lost many people recently. Um, thirdly is the whole perplexing issue of multiple complex humanitarian emergencies. Now, the Secretary General has announced a World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. And I think one of the questions is going to be, how are we, as organizations, as governments, how are we going to organize ourselves? How are we going to muster the political will and the resources that are going to be required if you're going to address a multiplicity of complex humanitarian emergencies at the same time? How do you continue to deal with the Syria, uh, with the problems we had earlier in Libya, with the remains of, what, of the work to be done in Haiti after the earthquake, with what's happened with the super typhoon uh, that I had to witness firsthand in Tacloban and Rosas and elsewhere in Philippines? How are we going to deal with all of these at one time in a sustained manner to help these countries uh, to move forward? It's a very, very difficult one, and unfortunately, many of these disasters, the trend seems to be that they're going to continue. So there's that. Um, and having just returned from the Philippines, I'm particularly conscious of this. Uh, the other thing is the loss of life at sea. I've mentioned already the irregular migration flows, and they're occurring everywhere from the Horn of Africa across the Red Sea, uh, from, the, from Haiti across the Caribbean to Florida, from South Asia across the Indian Ocean and other seas on the way to Indonesia and Australia. These are all issues that are going to require our attention, and these are some of the lows of this year that are likely to continue. There is an issue there also in terms of both, the, both these, these movements and the unaccompanied minors is the question of how are we going to protect particularly women and girls who are more vulnerable than anyone else along any migration route, but particularly in a time of disaster, bereft of home, of belongings, and money, totally helpless. Now, we just yesterday celebrated 
the International Day to Eliminate Violence Against Women. And this is something that has to be taken seriously. I can tell you we're working it into all of our camp coordination and camp management strategies because this has to have our attention or worse things will continue to happen. So let me, let me leave it with that simply saying that there are unprecedented uh, phenomena occurring over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, I've already mentioned unprecedented uh, and partially contradictory phenomenon numerically unprecedented numbers of people moving, multiple complex humanitarian emergencies, and the countervailing uh, view of anti-migrant policies. So the way forward is to move back to high road policies, greater coordination with all actors, and to innovate in order to accomplish orderly and safe migration. First is the continuity. Let me move quickly on this one, simply to say that I'm very pleased that you have chosen three years ago to establish a budget reform working group. We'll be hearing more from the chairman, and I want to thank personally uh, Ambassador Bertrand Crombouge, our rapporteur and our new second vice chair, for the good work that he has done. It's been a phenomenal a bit of work that he has put into this. You've also just agreed at the Standing Committee on Program and Finance in October to establish a working group on IOM UN relations and on the 12 point strategy that you gave us several years ago. I'm very pleased with this that you're going to take this under your own ambit to look at and to explore and to and to tell us whether you're happy with the current state or whether you want us to do something else. Uh, my position is very clear. We are totally neutral on the question. We will be available for technical of support, information, background, et cetera. But it is your committee, and we will look forward to supporting it and to hearing back from you. Now, this report, by the way, is going to be distributed immediately after uh, I finish speaking here, the whole report of my remarks now. Partnerships, a very important uh, uh, other part of our uh, continuity, the new observers we've just welcomed, regional economic commissions, where we're working across the board uh, with these uh, commissions around the world and civil society organizations. We're very pleased to see that we have a more expanded and regular relationship than in the past, although much remains to be done. We're still holding an annual CSO IOM senior consultation, bringing us together, and we're doing the same at the regional level. Uh, partnerships, public, uh, private sector, as you can see, there's a, a partial listing of the relatively new private sector partnerships. The first one has to do with establishing visa application centers, in this case with Canada, where we are establishing close to 48 uh, visa application centers around the world to assist in, in processing visas, uh, including the capturing of, of biometrics. Under this arrangement, We've established already more than uh, uh, more, uh, more of VACs in more than 40 countries, with all centers scheduled to be operational by uh, the end of the year. And we're expected to process more than 80,000 applicants uh, per year with VACs located across all continents, primarily in the developing world. The Gallup World Poll. We're very proud to have a new partner with Gallup. I called on the CEO in Washington not long ago. They are a major partner in the New World Migration Report of 2013. I spoke to Gallup yesterday. We will be meeting here on the 16th of December to do a briefing for donors, IOM and Gallup, as to what we see as the future, particularly in terms of joint research and publication. They have polling data that we could not normally uh, have any access to, but they're prepared now to share it with us, and we will be hearing more about this. They will also be partnering with us in the IOM uh, World Migration Port for 2015, focused on migrants and cities. Um, so I hope you will come to the briefing on the 16th. Partnership with the airlines. We have long-standing contracts with more than 20 airlines. We just had a, a briefing and reception for all of these airline representatives yesterday. We do this annually. Uh, our $125 million a year in contracts is a small drop 
in the ocean of their activity, but it's an extremely important part, and we tried to brief them on the humanitarian work that they were helping us to carry out. Uh, we have that partnership. Uh, Deloitte Touche uh, uh, Limited is another new contract, basically an initiative aiming to strengthen the man management processes uh, in uh, things such as our cluster on co camp coordination and camp management. AmeriCares Foundation, another standby partner with whom we work regularly in the field in Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, the Middle East, and elsewhere. The Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, FICCD, a new memorandum of understanding has just been concluded. This will allow us to do a number of uh, other activities, migration issues with the private sector in an important part of the world. CUNY Foundation on Logistics and Supply. Uh, we're doing now logistics and supply chain management uh, with CUNY Foundation. We have a master's program now at the University of Lugano uh, in partnership with uh, CUNY, who've been a good partner now for the past three or four years. And finally, DLA Piper, which has a, a partnership with our legal affairs department, uh, the largest international law firm, providing pro bono counsel worldwide for us. So these are just a few of our new private sector partnerships. Under professionalism, I'll just show you the slide. I'm not going to go into great detail. Simply to say that I consider myself extremely blessed and fortunate to have some of the finest colleagues in the field of international public service that you could find anywhere. Wherever I go, I'm extremely proud to see the work that your IOM staff are doing. They're all very enthusiastic, very dedicated, not afraid of hardship, not, a, not, not concerned about danger, willing to do what it takes to get the job done. And I think you can always say you can count on them to deliver good results on time and within budget. A few administrative issues. Some good news at the top of the slide. Amendments have been completed. I want to particularly congratulate and thank uh, Switzerland and Germany, the, the last two ratifications that were required. And I think we should give all of ourselves a round of applause for finishing the Constitution. Amendments. Thank you. Thank all of you who've ratified those. The arrears, uh, that will be addressed later, but we're at the lowest level we've been with only 14 countries now subject to uh, Article 4. Under the accession, that has to do with the membership I've already addressed. Uh, accountability. We now have an audit and oversight advisory committee that you asked us to establish. It's working now under revised terms of reference. It's doing very well. We have a new inspector general who is with us today and who many of you have met already. We will be doing a review of the IOM uh, structure uh, in the new year and I will be able to report back to you at next year's council on the results of that review, what, what uh, changes we wish to make, and how well is it doing. We have an issue, um, next slide. Uh, we have an issue of the middle income countries. What do we do in countries which are no longer receiving assistance because of their new status as middle income countries? There I think we have to look at more in, more ingenious ways of getting the job done. Um, I have a new idea also. Um, next slide. Sorry, one more. I didn't appear on that slide, but I want to come to it later I, I, on the property acquisition policy. The um, coherence. There's an unusually strong convergence of views at the UN General Assembly's high-level dialogue. And there you see most of the, the major ones. Strong emphasis on the rights of migrants. Strong emphasis on reducing the costs of migration. And I'll come to that in the third part of this presentation on initiatives we're taking there. Ethical recruitment, another initiative we'll be taking. Public perception of migrants and then integrating migration into development policy, which is basically about the post-2015 agenda. Next slide. So the, there was also strong convergence on the way forward. Interesting that the Secretary General's eight-point plan 
coincided very closely with the GMG six-point proposal, with civil society's eight-point proposal that uh, our representative Ted uh, Desam mentioned, and IOM's own six-point plan. Virtually all of them are saying the same thing, but no agreement on how we move these points forward. We're not waiting. We're looking for partners on this, but we're moving ahead on almost all of these points of convergence. I think you should be very pleased with the contribution that your organization made to the high-level dialogue. We either in partnership or alone produced five volumes as background for the high-level dialogue. You'll see them all there, and we can mention them sort of one by one, but they are there, and you will see a, an analysis of those books in the uh, report when you receive it uh, in a few minutes. So the high-level dialogue, uh, what we did there also, we strongly supported member states' own uh, preparations for the high-level dialogue. We did a position paper on the high-level dialogue, which you've all received. We did a, uh, some very fine pre uh, five preparatory uh, roundtables in New York, starting in June of last year and ending a year later, trying to bring the, the UN missions up to date, as up-to-date as you in Geneva are. We also did very, uh, very supported all of the regional uh, preparatory discussions. We did high-level discussions with ECOSOC when it met here in the spring of this past year. And we, we funded, uh, briefed the ECOSOC uh, delegation, and we also uh, briefed the, the, the missions in all of our uh, countries where we are now located. So we were very active in the high-level dialogue, and I think it has had some uh, salutary effect on the outcome. I also want to thank the government of Peru for convening the fourth global uh, RCP meeting of chairs and secretariats, which was held in Lima in May of this year. Um, we found that we were all pretty much uh, agreed on the importance of linking migration and development in enhancing the protection of human rights of migrants. Uh, we meet every two years in a, in a global forum like this, and we're very grateful to have had this good meeting in Lima. On the GFMD, the Global Forum, I have one thing, the Global Forum on Migration and Development, uh, we also are supporting the, the GFMD. We have been hosting the support unit since 2009. We are supporting the, the current, uh, the, the, the future chair, ILO, uh, and we will be working within the Troika of the previous chair, our chair, and the ILO chair to help them with papers and other preparatory work on central themes. We're working very closely now uh, with the Swedish government, which is in the chair and will be holding the Global Forum in April. Uh, we are also collaborating on a joint approach as GMG chair with the Global Forum, which you'll hear more about when Peter Sutherland joins us on Thursday. Finally, although we're short-staffed everywhere, we have decided that we must move forward and try to second an IOM staff member uh, to the Global Forum, uh, to, to the GMG. Um, Global Migration Group? We have been in the chair since the 1st of July. On the 3rd of July, we helped uh, uh, steer everyone toward a decision on how the GMG is functioning by getting a one-year chair and a one-year agenda. We have tried to coordinate the GMG position uh, on key matters, on the HLD uh, uh, and post-2015 uh, processes. We held a major high-level dialogue side event with the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, present for that and, and uh, who made remarks at that. And we did, uh, uh, we're doing a special high-level segment at the Council this week, we will have the Director General of ILO, uh, we'll have the, the head of the European, uh, the Economic Commission on Europe with us and several other members of the GMG that will be also on Thursday. Um, let's move on to the next one. I mentioned already that we met, we've had these new breakthroughs with the UN system. I won't go into more detail on that. 
Next one. I mentioned already uh, the efforts we're making in the area of gender, uh, uh, of combating gender-based violence, but we've also uh, working, I've been designated since 2011 to be the so-called champion or coordinator of all efforts within the UN system to combat uh, uh, sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. And I always think it's important to say that I was chosen for that position not because I succeeded, but because I failed. Because I failed when I was head of the UN peacekeeping mission in the Congo to keep soldiers, police, and civilian members of my staff from engaging in sexual exploitation. It led us, therefore, very quickly to put in place a policy and to put in tra in, in to train uh, teaching methods to help people to be more conscious of the, the problem of SEA. Moving on quickly to research, we're very happy with the publications we've been able to put out this year, 133. We've done 50 migration profiles, primarily with the financial support of the European Union. We have 10 more in progress. We put out a new volume on the post-2015 development agenda, Migrant Policy Perse uh, Perspective Series, and we just come out with a new book uh, on uh, climate change in the Axel Springer series, and we're co-chairing the data and research group for GMG. Next one. And we're doing a lot in the area of climate change. Let me move quickly to my final point on change. I think this is probably the part of my presentation that might be of the most interest to you because these are initiatives that we're hoping to take, uh, some of which we're already taking, with your support. We will be doing policy initiatives in the months ahead, coming up with the humanitarian policy framework with strong support from several governments, uh, members of IOM. We'll be doing something on migration advocacy guidelines and a paper on migration, a migrant protection policy and operational framework. What we understand, on what kind of protection do we do? What do we understand under that? We will also be doing the international conference I mentioned on migrants and cities. And we will be launching a global information campaign to try to highlight the contributions of migrants as one means of trying to counter anti-migrant sentiment. We will look to you for support on that because it will probably take more resources than we currently have, but we believe in getting started. Some other ongoing in initiatives. We simply have to do something together about the cost of transferring remittances home. There's something irresponsible about having to pay 12 to 15 percent to send your money back home to put food on the table, to educate children, to take care of the sick and elderly. It's, it's taken too long to get to this point. We're determined to launch something this year. I've talked to the Universal Postal Union in Bern. They have some ideas. We're going to be talking to the banks. We would like all of you in, in your individual uh, government consultations to see what you could do locally. We have to find a way to get those costs down, and they should go down below 5%. Because if you have $400 billion a year going back home, and you take 12 to 15% out of that, that is a huge loss in support for families back home. Recruitment costs. It's simply irresponsible, bordering on criminal. When people are sent abroad by recruitment agencies, thinking they're going to one job and they go into another one. You're going in as a domestic worker and you end up in prostitution ring. Or you get to a place and you find out you have to pay the first year of your salary to repay the recruitment agency. We cannot allow this anymore. So we will come up with a set of universal standards or a code of conduct. We'll need your support on it because this will not go down easily in some countries to basically say that we have to agree that if you're going to be a recruitment agency, you have to subscribe to a set of standards. A lot will depend on how much we can come up with a robust compliance, a monitoring and compliance mechanism. The Migration Crisis Operational Framework, you know about from last year. It's gone much further this year. We've gone, done globally a series of, of training exercises. 
and we're now trying to link it into the Migrants in Crisis initiative that the Special Representative, Mr. Peter Sutherland, is engaged in. You'll hear more about that. So the other, the other one I wanted to mention that's not on the screen is a property acquisition policy. We need to help you stretch the money that you provide the administration. We can stretch it further if we can begin to purchase property rather than leasing property. I know it can be done. We won't be able to do it everywhere. We'll be doing a survey. We know that we own a couple of buildings already, and we need to go into this in order to save money for the organization. So let me finally, one final slide, just to say that we may be on the cusp of real change in how people think about human mobility, uh, or we may not be. We hope we are. We need to change our way of thinking to know that large-scale migration in our world of today, it is inevitable if we're going to deal with the demography of an aging industrialized world and a youthful developing society. It's going to be necessary if we're going to fill the jobs and have the skills available for sustainable inclusive growth. And it's absolutely desirable if we manage it well with good policies. My apology for the length of my presentation. Thank you.